dark regions of the other, we crawl out toward you and bring to you the answers you seek. That's right, Troy. Welcome to another episode of You'll Only Listen Twice, our podcast where we're taking a look at all the Bond movies, both official and unofficial. Last week, we went over our top what was it? From 29 to 11 favorite Bond movies? It was. And we talked about the Bond girls, the Bond villains. This week is the rest of what we talked about. That is the top 10 best objective final list of James Bond films. The movies you ought to see. We're also talking about our favorite Bond gadgets and our favorite Bond songs and our favorite Bond actors. David Niven in the house. Barry Nelson in the house. Hit subscribe and hit play and keep listening and don't turn us off. I know you want to. All right. Before we go to our top 10, I give the floor back to you three. Time code number Four, five, I don't know, numbers no more. So right now we're taking a break (laughs) to take a look at the best Bond gadgets and Bond songs. Why why did you just talk like a guy from Collider? Because now we're in the part of the podcast that is more awardsy, and this is the bit. Anyway, Jan, do you want to start with your list of gadgets and song? Yeah. Go with gadgets I, first. Gadget. Oh, this is hurting my throat. I can't. Yeah, <laughs> so, I'm, not, I'm not doing gadgets. it. Gadgets. Well, it's a bunch of explosives, really. Love the exploding <laughs> pen from Golden and I. Three clicks. Arms the four second fuse. Love the exploding toothpaste. Dentonite toothpaste. It's the latest in plastic explosive. Pretty much every gadget in OK Connor is a winner, <laughs> you know? Especially the one that sticks out to me is the fucking ceiling with spikes, uh, and then the desk that turns into a boat. <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful stuff. You know, I was originally gonna say my favorite gadget was gonna be the invisible car from Die Another Day. Uh, you can say that. Aston Martin, call it the Vanquish, we call it the Vanish. It's so quintessential, silly Bond, so cool. I love it, and it was the coolest shit to me as a kid, and it's the coolest shit to me as an adult. But, but, to me, the coolest gadget ever is one that James Bond doesn't even use. It's the couch that swallows yes! people. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sit down and make yourself comfortable. <laughs> that is the most bizarre cursed shit I've ever seen, and I love it. That's my favorite gadget. <laughs> we still don't know where, where does the guy go. I don't know what it's for. I don't know where they go. <laughs> I think that guy is. I think it's like a like a man eating carnivore plant or something. Like he just disintegrates. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um. I don't know. It's the proof to me that Q is in hell right now. The best gadget <laughs> in the series. Wait, I thought the proof that Q was in hell was that time he ate it the contrast with the bolo. Balls, Q. Bolus, double O seven. Good. Have that ready for army day. Yes, sir. Uh, well, that's no, the thing. This, uh, this it's is worth worse. mentioning. A lot of the best gadgets are just the ones that we see Q tinkering with in various Egyptian tombs. The tray table? I don't, I don't know if the the fake third nipple counts as a gadget, but I'll also throw in as a, an honorable mention. I would count that. Because I really want to like it. Titillating. Okay, Troy. Uh, yes, I would agree. I love the couch. I love the wheelchair missile launcher. Morning, Q. Sorry about the leg. Skiing. Hunting. I love the ski pole gun. I love the gondola hoverboat. I love Q sandwich. Don't touch that. It's my lunch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's my lunch. I love the tray table that decapitates people if they didn't already say it. I want that ready for Ackman's tea party. I don't love, but someone has to mention Snooper, the dog, from A View to a Kill. You would realize that this is a prototype of a highly sophisticated surveillance machine. Why do we have Snooper? 
And of course, I love the many exploding pens and cigarette lighters where James Bond will just be like, Blofeld, I'm going to take a smoke. <laughs> Shoots a guy for no reason. Very neat. It can save your life, this cigarette. You sound like a commercial. Very funny. But the gadget that is nearest and dearest to my heart is that alligator submarine, the crocodile submarine from Octopussy. I love it. I love it to see Roger Moore's head poking out. That's a good pick. I, I should yeah. have known. I like how it's a very <laughs> short distance. It's a very short moat. So why does he have to put on a whole alligator suit to get across that moat? But there's so much detail and love put into it. And it reminds me of Peter Pan. And Peter Pan, as we all know, is a core memory of the human race. Because there's a crocodile. It's like Peter Pan. <laughs> this checks out. Jan, Jan, it's a crocodile with an aging Englishman inside yeah. it. With a deformity, a third nipple. With a deformity, a third nipple, and he's inside a crocodile just Now like you're just Cook. being mean to Roger Moore's mole. I love Roger Moore. <laughs> These are some solid picks. The, the, we had a lot of bangers, I must say. I gotta yeah. give a shout out to the exploding pen. How long did you say the fuse was? Oh, grow up, 007. I gotta give a shout out to the x-ray glasses. Improved specs because that's just oh, classic, yes. like, kid shit. By kids. Yes. Exploding, or no, uh, invisible car. Adaptive camouflage, tiny cameras on all sides project the image they see onto a light-emitting polymer skin on the opposite side. You see, to the casual eye, it's as good as invisible. That's pretty cool, but I gotta say, OK Connery, hands down, has, like, throughout, they're all incredible. The one that I just will think about when I'm not doing anything, <laughs> you know, on any given day, on a, uh, when you're sleeping, when, uh, I don't know who it is. It's like what? It's like his lady's tyke. It's not money, Penny. Whatever. Anyway, the there's girlfriend. Maybe he's wearing like a jumpsuit with a belt. Takes off the belt. The belt inflates into a small spear and throws it at a guy and kills him. <laughs> <laughs> this is the kind of like cartoon logic. It's like a dream. It's just so magical. But as Jan has mentioned, they're not actually spikes that come out of the ceiling. They are gun muzzles that are all pointed in one direction. Oh, right, and shooting right. I people. forgot. <laughs> it's even better. And the <laughs> inflatable dinghy is not inside a desk, it's inside a uh, baby grand piano. <laughs> <laughs> See, I misremembered it and made it worse. What's in the movie is much more magical. <laughs> yeah, so that, and I'm sure there are way more that I'm forgetting. They're just so so brilliant. And, so wacky. And some, there's something with the Meow Meow Cats. Anyway, a lot of bangers, but the belt takes it. This is the best Italian movie I've ever seen after eight and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Jake. Uh, you guys had really good picks, which makes my top picks... Very boring <laughs> because, yeah, we've seen some crazy shit in that Bond doesn't even use. We didn't even mention the uh, the mat that shoots out a spike in The Spy You Love Me. Yeah. And Bond goes like, brings a tear to your eye. Bring tears to your eyes. And then just the thing that just shoots a guy up in the air. <laughs> oh, the priest laser guns, I and forgot the priest to. laser guns, which... Oh. Come yeah. back later in the movie. Everyone uses laser guns at the end. <laughs> but really, honestly, this is kind of a tie between these two. It's got to be the exploding pen. Don't say it. The writing's on the wall? Along with the rest of it. Because of just the payoff. It's very satisfying. It's a classic. It's an all-timer. It's the most satisfying payoff to a gadget in any one of these movies. It's simple, effective, and also a great plot device. My other pick is also extremely basic. It's the Aston Martin DB5. You'll be using this Aston Martin DB5 with modifications. Of course. It's just like... Did you like when they brought it back in no time I was going to say, die? if no one mentions it, we need to give it a shout out because I am not a car guy. That car is fucking cool and I want this it. This is the greatest car in the history of cinema. In history, in just in history, it's the most beautiful car. It shoots guns, it has oil slick, a rear bullet screen, 
Uh, there was even more gadgets that they didn't even include in the movie. There was a telephone and also Bond's Attachy case from From Rush With Love was stored in the passenger seat. This car has fucking everything and every single car wants to be the Aston Martin DB5. Even the Vanquish. Vanquish is great. We love the Vanquish. I know other people don't, but we love it. But y you can't beat the classic, and it's the DB5. That's There's a reason why it keeps coming back. It's fucking cool. It looks it's good. Such a, it's such a pretty car. Did it really come back before Skyfall, and then they wouldn't let it go? Uh, No, it came back with Goldeneye. Oh, when he's sexually harassing that lady. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, that doesn't narrow it down much, but I know what you're talking about. Now, uh, let's <laughs> move on to the next section. We're going to be talking about the best James Bond theme songs. And we've invited all the artists to come on this podcast and perform their song. Wait, what? None of, none of, the, most, none of them. Oh, no. Well, Duran Duran's in my apartment right now. Should I just tell him to leave? Tell him to fuck off. I'm, I'm sorry, guys. They don't, they don't want you here. I'm sorry. Uh... Bring in Gladys Knight. No! Yay! <laughs> all right, um, Jan. So, I pretty much like all the songs. The only ones I really hate are Writings on the Wall and Never Say Never Again. Fuck those, I, uh, they're terrible. But the ones that are I really, really like are A View to a Kill, Thunderball, Tomorrow Never Dies, The World Is Not Enough, You Only Live Twice, We Have All the Time in the World, Goldeneye, you know my name, Live and Let Die, of course. These top two were very fucking hard to determine which was one, but number two was Nobody Does It Better from The Spy Who Loved Me. Nobody does it better. Incredible, one of the most sing-along worthy songs for me ever. It's my go-to karaoke song, but my number one, of course, it's Skyfall. It is the best one. It was a huge hit for a reason. It has everything you want from a Bond song in it. It starts slow, it builds, it builds, it builds, and then you come at the end. I love it. Very nice. Now, Troy, what is your top? I think Bond, part of why he's so popular is the Bond song. I think most of these are very good. There are some all-time stinkers. The worst one is License to Kill. No, that's and a good song. I don't... I don't care for Moonraker, Tomorrow Never Dies. Moon, Moonraker is the best, truly best. <laughs> I was waiting for you to say Moonraker was the best because you, and then talk about tucking again. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the tucking, I do with all of these, so God I don't. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Okay. Guys, I need to talk about my top 10. I can't have you be doing bits you're going to edit out during my top 10. Yeah, so they're all pretty good. And shout out to Three Blind Mice. Three Blind Mice in the room. Three Blind Mice, there they go. Which isn't that <laughs> That is not, no. Yeah. It isn't that yeah. I, I have maintained this opinion for decades. Oh, well, underneath the mango tree is also in your top. <laughs> no, no. Underneath the mango tree is like all the time in the world. It is not eligible. I'm just going to say that up front. I do not consider all the time in the world an opening title song. So it is not eligible for this. We've book. been having this argument for years about what <laughs> actually qualifies as a Bond song. <laughs> we Troy, fought between Troy and I. over this. Yeah. All right, but I should actually say my ranking so I can go to sleep, maybe. Number 10, Living Daylight. Nice. Love, uh -huh. Love that 80s song. Yeah, that one's mid. Nine, Screw You, Paul. You Only Live Twice is a wonderful song. Very romantic, very chill, yet haunting. Great song. Eight, A View to a Kill, movie garbage, song great, fun, bouncy, Duran Duran, I don't want to see you, get out of Jan's apartment, you did a good yeah, job. Yeah, guys, I already told you, I don't have any chicken, I don't have chicken, please. Maybe they've been staying too long at that weird uh, clinic in the Alps. Do you remember when you first came here, how you hated chicken? All right, go on, Troy, I'm going to get these people out of my Okay, yeah. Speaking of which, six, we did not give this song enough credit. The World Is Not Enough. Fantastic villain song. Fantastic song. Absolutely. Clearly the musical highlight of the Brosnan era. I quite love it. So my top five. Nobody Does It Better, The Spy Who Loved Me. D Duh. Duh. It's not quite as exciting as I would like it to be, which is why it's only number five. Fantastic, though. Four. All right, Bond fans. Come at me. I might be the only one on this podcast who loves Goldfinger. Goldfinger. 
<laughs> what a controversial take. No one else has said it, but I think Goldfinger is a great Bond song. It sets the template. It, Bond songs weren't really a thing before Goldfinger. The, except in Dr. No, Three Blind Mice. <laughs> and the, number three, the best Bond song before the Craig era is definitely Live and Let Die. Live and Let Die. Awful movie, all-time great rock song. It's fantastic. It's exciting. It flies. Maybe not the Calypso part. Maybe it would be more competitive. Still the the best wing song by far. Much like Jan, these top two, very hard for me. Um, One of them is the objective answer, and one of them is the answer of my heart. For once, Troy listened to his head instead of his heart. And he put the objective one first. But the second one is, you know my name from Casino Royale. You know my name. I listen to this song all the time. Oh, it hits my brain and, and I'm just activated. This movie is like adrenaline, the song. Uh, but Jan is correct. The best Bond song of all time is Skyfall. Let the sky fall. If I don't listen to it as much as you know my name, it's because I was obsessed with it in high school. I would only listen to Skyfall on a loop. I love Skyfall. Holy crap, did I skip For Your Eyes Only in between A View to a Kill and The World Is Not Enough? You did. I did. I also love For Your Eyes Only. That's number seven. If For Your Eyes Only and The Spy Who Love Me are slow paced and you know my name and live and let die are fast paced skyfall is the perfect marriage and they have been chasing that high they'll never reach it skyfall is james bond wonderful uh i'm just gonna give you my five these are songs that i like and <laughs> not related to james bond <laughs> yeah <laughs> not, related to james <laughs> com- not remotely re- related but bones whatever. by the killers uh yeah. yes. <laughs> Uh, number five, For Your Eyes Only, It's a Bop. Number four, Tomorrow Never Dies, It's a Bop. Number three, Skyfall, It's a Bop. But now (laughs) we're getting to slightly more in the question of, does it tie with the movie? It does tie with the movie. It's classy. The vibes are good. Much like the film, you're kind of like, what is this really about? But whatever. Number two, You Know My Name. You Know My Name exactly what it is about it's completely in step adrenaline vibes everything is on point and you're like hell yeah. yes but number one i gotta give it to thunderball, thunderball. this yeah. is the sound of james bond this is james bond's song it is about yes. james bond it's so good it describes him it has the bombast tom jones's voice is one thousand percent he's the coolest motherfucker in the world it's everything you need to know communicated in music what is james bond and guess who's gonna see tom jones performing thunderbolt live on friday wait really oh yeah wait jan make him do the duck dodgers theme. i've got i'm gonna i'm gonna uh, but yes i am very excited this is a a mars attacks dream of mine there you go we did it jake so brave your your number one pick i i adore it you're so brave to live with your love for (laughs) thunderbolt yeah no uh these are honorable mentions uh for your eyes only you only live twice uh, from Rush With Love, Diamonds Are Forever, View to a Kill. My number 10 spot. Not one person has said this yet, which I'm kind of surprised. Jan said, we have all the time in the world, but failed to mention Honor Majesty's Secret Service by John Barry, the instrumental in the opening credits song. Well, that's not a song. It's not a song. It's like singing. <laughs> it yeah. is a fucking banger, and I think it's even better than the 007 theme that john barry did not the james bond theme you know it's got that heroic like yeah but he just ripped it off from the trailer of the incredibles (laughs) yeah (laughs) well showtime but uh honor man's secret service Great instrumental song. Shame on you guys for not liking number nine, The Living Daylights. Hey, I put that at number 10. Except for Troy. Mid. Living Daylights is not mid. Uh, I, I like the weird vocals. I love the guitar. I especially love the, 
arrangement that John Barry does with the vocals, because you can compare it with the other version, it's not as good. I think it's a killer song. Uh, Golden Eye, Tina Turner's great. Uh, love it. I love the vocals at the end with the Golden Eye. Very classy. Then we get The World Is Not Enough. I would put this even higher on my list. I was thinking about doing this, but I'm just going to keep it here at number seven. Uh, number six is Thunderball. Paul already said it's his favorite. Nothing more to say. It is very stereotypical Bond. When you think of Bond, you think of Thunderball. And you also think of my next one, number five, Goldfinger, because it was the first, because From Rush With Love by Matt Monroe, who didn't play in the opening titles, but it played at the end. Goldfinger plays at the beginning, and it is so over-the-top and crazy and campy and fun, and it sets the perfect tone for watching a Bond movie. Number four, Love and Let Die, goes without saying, because it's great. Great rock song. Nobody does it better. The sweetest Bond song probably of all time. Skyfall is number two. And number one, of course, is You Know My Name. You know my name. Great introduction for this new version of James Bond. And Chris Cornell's vocals are fucking killer. Mm. And you also got David Arnold on top of that doing the instrumentals. Awesome. Anyway, let's move on. And the, the, the lyrics are good, too, because I do know his name. It's Chris Cornell. So it's all, it all <laughs> yeah. back. Well, the title sequence helps you with that. Right. Yeah, no, one day I may be with you, Jake, and put that as the top Bond song, because it's the one I listen to the most. It, it's very It's the exciting. one I listen to the most, too. And remember, everyone, Rolling Stone put it at, like, 21 they're wrong on its list of bond songs and and they're music journalists well i have something to tell you mr rolling stone <laughs> mr mick jagger <laughs> all right let's get to the top 10 <laughs> yes so officially the official top 10 best james bond movies of all time this is official i talked to the ghost of ian fleming no fuck that guy he was racist yeah but he told me th these are the correct ranking okay all right so i'm gonna be honest guys when I was compiling this list, some of these results were rather shocking. <laughs> and listeners at home, if you're still listening, I have no idea how this is going to edit together. My voice is shot. So, going into the list, you may have noticed one name has not passed our lips in this discussion so far. That name is Piers Brosnan. Are uh, all four in the top 10? Hell yeah. Yes. So now related <laughs> to that point, the next three movies in our top 10 all have a lower average rating than from Russia with love. So coming in at number 10, your favorite Brosnan movie and mine, The World Is Not Enough. The World Is Not Enough. With an average ranking of 11.5 and an average rating of 6.875 out of 10. Fun movie. Brosnan has the most consistent run as Bond. They're all pretty good. That's not what you said when your wife was here. I did. I literally said those exact same words. Yeah. This is still my least favorite one. Not by much. It's still pretty good. Yeah, uh, this movie tries to be a character study while also delivering the goods but the character stuff is a little thin at least for me and it's in disservice to the action which is generally pretty goddamn fun in this movie even though it's the worst brazen it's still pretty good all right and now you two get to be quiet because you both put it at 16 on your list oh yeah it's 16 on mine <laughs> yeah it's 16 on mine too. jan gave it a six out of 10, the lowest ranking of the group. I gave it an eight and I put it six on my list. Paul gave it a seven and put it eight at his list. And that's why it's in the top 10 because me and Paul uh -huh. save this. Paul, would you like to weigh in on this superior motion picture? Uh, it's a good time. It is the third best Pierce. And that's pretty good because we love Pierce. And again, maybe this reflects more on the films below it than the films above it on my ranking. And again, it does not reflect at all of the fact that we were born in the 90s. And when we were gaining cognizance of the world around us, Pierce Brosnan was James Bond. The World Is Not Enough is my favorite Pierce Brosnan James Bond movie because it actually tries to tell a story with Pierce Brosnan's version of James Bond. I've often remarked he comes off as a psychopath. Uh, but in this movie, he has a point. The woman is evil. She is going to blow up a pipeline. 
<laughs> she is a terrorist. And Pierce Brosnan is on fire. Sophie Marceau is a great Bond villain. The Bond girl turned villain is such a great move. Judy Dench gives a turn as M where she's stupid, but not as stupid as she will become. <laughs> so you're like, oh no, M has become betrayed. No, not become M. Betrayed. I am become betrayed, <laughs> destroyer of worlds. M has cheeseburger and has become betrayed. <laughs> betrayed. And Pierce it has his limit. And I love the giant buzzsaw. What always holds it back for me is it doesn't have the best action of the Brosnan era. I love you, Michael App Ted. You are not an action director. If it had action, then it would be a masterpiece. Well, it's got the boat chase. Oh, yeah. I should say opening is. One the best of one. The greatest yeah. things that's ever been put on film. And the <laughs> yeah. rest of the movie can't live up to it. Up there with the parrot from Citizen Kane. It's great. <laughs> up there. Yes. Other great. than that shot from uh, Joker Folly Ado where she lost a smile. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, the entire trailer of Joker 2 is the best movie of all time. We can all agree. <laughs> and again, I want to clarify to all our listeners, we record these episodes live as you're hearing them. Yes. The Joker 2 trailer just came out yesterday. It just came out you yesterday. You are going crazy. Or we didn't find it until then because we're very bad at the internet. A man so evil. He finds crime funny. <laughs> Who would ever smile while they're killing people? Anyway, back to James Bond. So cool. The back Joker. to James. It, uh, James Bond, our favorite psych. Well, no, my favorite psychopath is the Joker. <laughs> <laughs> Pierce Brosnan is the Joker, baby. <laughs> oh, he would be such a good Joker. Oh. He's he's basically the Joker in Mamma Mia 2. <laughs> I'm assuming that number nine is going to be another Pierce. Shut up. <laughs> I'm I get to call number nine. Okay. All right. I love the world is not enough. I know from fan comments, if we still have fans after this episode, that they were very mad about our world is not enough review because they felt we were too nice to it. So I am proud to say I have nothing to do with how high up this next movie got. Oh, with oh, an average oh. ranking <laughs> of eleven point twenty-five and an average rating of six point seven five which you'll notice is lower than the last two movies. <laughs> Die Another Day. Yeah! Sigmund Freud, analyze this, analyze bitch. This, baby. <laughs> oh, God. This is the best Pierce Brosnan movie by far. It's Camp Bond at its best. Not a single dull moment. Masterpiece. Already said, favorite Bond film. <laughs> uh, this movie is completely bananas and is a completely of its time, and people need to get on its level of understanding it, including Barbara Broccoli. <laughs> you should not be ashamed of this freak show that you created. Yes. Hey, and Pierce Brosnan, who got his heart broken by Jan. <laughs> He likes this movie. I have no regrets. But yes, like you said, this is like a Bella Tar movie. If you meet it at its level, what? you'll have a great time. I'm sorry, I'm sleep deprived. Did you just say that another day it's like a Bella Tar movie? No, you imagined it. <laughs> <laughs> pure fiction, pure fiction. But yes, die another day. It is the Spy Kids of James Bond, and Spy Kids is one of the great works in cinema. Oh my god. So James Bond was right to imitate it, but I, I'm not going to give it a, a 10 out of 10 or anything, but it, it was pretty funny. Troy also loved it. Uh, so number eight. No, no, no. I know we lost like 10 subscribers after that episode, but like, let's actually break down the math behind how this die another day, how die another day ended up as one of the top 10 best James Bond movies. Cause it is. I'm as shocked as you listeners. In terms of the ranking, Paul put it at 16, not terribly high. I put it at 22, because it's bad. Jake put it at four. <laughs> Out of all the Bond movies, Jake put it at four. <laughs> Jan. <laughs> I gave it a 10 out of 10. I had to be true to my word. Uh, you did not give it a 10 out of 10, and we're going to talk about that. Yeah, young I did. Man. You no, did. you didn't. Roll the tape. We will roll the tape. I just listened to the tape three hours ago. Jan, you gave it a three, even though on the tape, you said it was the greatest Bond movie ever. So yes, to the ratings. I gave it the lows of four. Paul gave it a six. Jake gave it a seven. He says it is Logically a seven, but in my heart a ten. And I take the logic because 
and drink you, down but what, this. What, what did I give it account. and where do I rank it? You gave it a 10, but in that episode, you said it will definitely be the greatest James Bond movie we ever watched. <laughs> yeah. Two movies surpassed it, but it's at number three. I think up to that point, it's the best one. But you had, okay, I'll allow it. <laughs> we all know our fans have memorized all our episodes and they know all of our ratings. So I have to be honest. Honestly, if you tell me, would you rather watch Goldfinger or Die Another Day? No. Die Another no. Day. <laughs> no. Minute. I mean, to me, no. probably, <laughs> even though I did give Goldfinger yes. a higher rate. No. It kind of depends on, I'll, I will say, depends on my mood that day. <laughs> it depends on the amount of margaritas you've had that, on the amount of mojitos. Mojitos. <laughs> <Yeah>. Mojitos. Mojito. <laughs> Joy is storming out. So, in the, in the words of Jake, great movie, we all love it. So, <laughs> number seven. All right, listeners, don't worry. You are not being gaslit. Die Another Day is the Batman and Robin of James Bond movies. And that's a good it's thing. It's not good. It's a mess. <laughs> Batman and Robin is more heart. This just has nonsense. But good villains. Now, if you're still listening to us, why? But if you are, and you were a little rocked by the world is not enough and die another day being in our top 10, this next one may shock you, but members of the Troy cult will know this is not shocking at all. Oh. That's right. Coming in at number no eight. No way. <laughs> with an average ranking of Eight and an average score of seven out of ten. We, oh my god. Octopussy! Holy an shit! An all time high. High. Uh, not in my top ten, but I'm still happy that it is. <laughs> I said you only live twice was my rediscovery. This was actually the big rediscovery, which I always thought it was like. Uh, it's one of the paint by numbers, Bond. Is that no, 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 Not no, at no? All. Rewatch it. This has some of the best action, some of the most creative ideas here. The setting is gorgeous. It's the best John Glenn, in my opinion. Very versatile, also shifting yes. from different types of escapist movies of yesteryear. You got like a gun Din moments. You got a Hitchcockian spy thriller, and then it becomes a Powell and Pressburger <laughs> movie by the end. It's funny, the first time I watched it, it was like you. I'm like, this is just whatever, but it's so entertaining and it just keeps going throughout. It keeps shifting. They manhunt Bond. It has a great, maybe the greatest of all these train sequences. Uh, he dresses up as a clown and he gives a great performance. Yeah, it's Roger Moore's best performance, hands down. Not only does he dress up as a clown, he dresses up as a gorilla. <laughs> yes, it's wonderful. Oh yeah, that's right. And he swings from the trees like Tar. Oh, I love this movie. <laughs> First time Bond is like caring about human life. Yeah. Uh, and not magical. in a cheesy way, but in a believable way is great. So this movie gets a lot of gruff um, from Bond fans like Jake. Hey, I, w I, I turned my opinion around during the episode. I like it. Exactly. There were two episodes I was scared of recording. I remember when we ended For Your Eyes Only, Jake said Octopus is one of the bad ones. I don't know what Drew is talking about. But then we all watched Octopussy in the embrace of Octopussy in our hearts. Oh, warm embrace. I am deep in that Octopussy. James Bond is an adventure franchise. And of all the movies, I think in some ways this feels the most like a classic adventure film. He sword fights in it. He's swinging around. He's going to exotic castles. Like it feels like an Errol Flynn mm. movie. That's why I like it. And that classical storytelling, again, much like The Man with the Golden Gun, but better, it's a bunch of wacky stuff in a bunch of different locations. But the emotional through line of what James Bond is doing is always there. Yeah. You have one of my favorite scenes in the series where him and Octopussy meets and he just talks matter of factly about how he allowed her dad to take the gentleman's way out. And when he's scared about the nuclear bomb, the tension is so palpable, even though he's dressed as a clown. And it's not a cool movie. Like, I think that's why a lot of people say it's the worst one is because James Bond does not look cool in it, but he is a hero. For once, James Bond is a hero in heroic fiction, and that's what I want out of the franchise. 
which is why I gave it a 9 out of 10. It's my third favorite James Bond film. Jan and Paul feel similarly. They gave it a 7 and an 8. Paul put it at 9. Jan put it at 6. Jake put it at 14. And according to my spreadsheet, I have Jake giving Octopussy a 4. Yeah. I'm not sure that entirely makes sense to me. That may be a typo. No, I put it at a 4. No, that's not a typo. Wait, you gave it a 4 out of 10? 5. 5 out of 10? No, I gave it a 4 out of 5. I'm looking at my spreadsheet right here. You people are terrible at math. <laughs> <laughs> no, and the average makes sense, because if the average score is 8, it would be a 9 and a 7 and 8 and an 8. So, Octopussy, go watch it. Reevaluate it. It's great. Please do. If you take anything away from the James Bond podcast, is that Octopussy is a genuinely good movie that holds up much better than Temple of Doom. We all no, agree. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> you guys are mean. Also, I'm, I'm getting the news in. I, I just got a call because of these numbers. I, I'm losing my autism diagnosis because I'm so bad at all these numbers. <laughs> I'm just a nerd, apparently. I'm just a nerd. Rain Man will revoke the, <laughs> the card. What if James Bond walked into the casino and Rain Man was there? That would be so crazy, he, man. He'd be toasted. And what if the Joker was there? <laughs> <laughs> Felix Leiter is like, I'm not good enough to take out Rain Man. You are. We're gonna catch you. Back. Yeah, we need we need one of those like uh, dogs playing poker <laughs> paintings with James Bond, Rain Man, and the Joker. <laughs> yes. Oh, I would put that in my den. Oh, totally. That would that would tie the room together. The the Council of Autism. <laughs> The high, the high table. <laughs> oh God! Now it's like the spectrum. Yeah, just, the spectrum. The spectrum is like James Bond on the far like left, like high functioning. High functioning. And then functioning. Joker is on the opposite end, and then Rain Man is somewhere. Rain like, Man is the perfect combination of James Bond and the Joker. <laughs> I never understood the autistic spectrum ever since I was diagnosed as a child. I'm like. What is it? What's the spectrum? But now I see what it is. It's how close you are to James Bond or the, or Joker. the Joker. They both wear tuxedos and are white. They're both clowns. Yeah, that's They're true. both clowns, as we saw in Octopussy. All right. So we're now going, if you're still with us after that. After whatever that was. Or whatever that one. <laughs> <laughs> just late. Now this has oh. become late night ramblings. <laughs> it's one a.m. <laughs> We're on to hour five. Uh, okay. So next up, with an average ranking of seven point twenty-five, much like Octopussy, it appears on three out of four top tens, but it has an average rating of seven point seven five. That's right, Bond fans. You know it, you love it, it's Goldeneye. Goldeneye. Yeah! Hell yeah. Might not be the deconstruction as Bond that a lot of Bond fans like to think it is, but it doesn't no. matter because this movie has some of the best action. It's fun as fuck. How does Bond enter the 90s? He just puts his dick on the table and just says, whatever. <laughs> I'm just what? like, do, do the same thing, well, but, but what bigger. Am <laughs> whatever. Combine the 90s energy with... Pierce Brosnan. And it's gold, and I. And that is all you need because Pierce Brosnan is James Bond. The end. It's very, <laughs> it's very straightforward. It's very fun. It's my childhood Bond movie, so I have a lot of nostalgia for it. I really like it. And floops in it, so automatic bump. I am invincible! <laughs> yep. Yeah. As the Debbie Downer in the room, I gave it the lowest rating. They all gave it 8 out of 10. Listeners, I gotta be honest with you, I gave it a 7 out of 10. How dare you? Fuck, fuck off. You've gotten That's your Bond again. license revoked. But we all like it. Yeah, we all like it. Paul put it the highest at 4. I put it at 13. If I'm slightly off, I still enjoy it. It's still a, fun, a lot of fun. Zeniana top. Alec Trevelyan's a little wonky, but he has a great death scene. Great to see this many Irishmen in a James Bond movie. Pierce is hot. And if it's not in my top 10, it's just because, hey, not everything can be in your top 10. We got to make choice. Now, before we go into the top five, we must deal with a man, a very special man. He comes from the land down under, and his name is George Lazenby. I don't know who that is. <laughs> uh, oh, he's a weirdo. With an average ranking of seven and an average rating of 7.75, 
we have come to on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is also the favorite between Bond fans because this is the one that's close to the Ian Fleming novel, and it also ends with tragedy. Yeah. So Bond fans automatically love it. But it's also a good movie on, on top of that. Uh, it is first-time director Peter Hunt, and he comes out with a fucking bang, weirdly influenced by European art house <laughs> to, to make it, uh, at least in terms of editing, or that's just like the economy of editing Peter Hunt, who knows? But also, this is like a Bond... It's refreshing to have George Lazenby because we have a fresh face actor who is has the chance to grow with the love of his life, but he is cursed to always be James Bond by the end. As the end promises us, James Bond will return, and he returns as Sean Connery in Diamonds Are Forever. He's regressed. Yes, this movie, <laughs> I won't say it's perfect because it is kind of a mess. It's very structurally weird. It jumps around a lot. The whole middle chunk is this, like, fever dream in the Alps. It's like a weird orgy. But it is kind of this beautiful mess where it's like, I enjoy all the disjointed tonal shifts. And even though I would have wished that Tracy was in the whole movie and not just, like, showing up here and there, that relationship really, really sells it at the end. It is the one of the strongest emotional cores in any of these movies. And it also looks beautiful. It's one of the best-looking Bond movies. Oh, yeah, yeah it looks very nice. Yeah. I really it's like up there it. with uh, Skyfall. Spy Who Loved Me. Spy Who Loved Me. Diamonds are for it. No, I'm just yeah. kidding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a View to a Kill. A View to a Kill. Yeah. 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 The yeah. most beautiful Die another day. Bond. Die another day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Um, no, it, yeah, it, it's, it's uneven, and it could be considered a little over long, but uh, yeah, uh, Diana Rigg in particular and Telly Savalas really helped yeah. George Lazenby. My favorite Blofeld, I think. Yeah. George Lazenby? Well, well they helped George Lazenby because George Lazenby is kind of, well, he's a novice actor, so he's a little bit meh, but they give him a great villain and a great heart <laughs> with Tracy. And the movie has a really good heart. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. That's her. Next to, like, Octopussy and The Spy Who Loved Me, and I think Casino Royale 2006, I do think this is one of the Bond movies where if it was a person and it died, it would go to heaven. Most James Bond movies, I would not yeah, say Yeah, it's that. like the only one, pretty <laughs> much, that you can, yeah. that has, like, a goodness radiating out of it. Yeah. <laughs> and not just, like, ashtray and used <laughs> condoms. <laughs> That's the next movie. Um, <laughs> we all gave it an average rating of 8 out of 10, except for Paul, who gave it a 7 out of 10. However, Paul then ranked it higher than me and Jake, where we both put it at 8 on our list. Paul put it at seven, and Jan put it at five. This basically has the reputation of being an underrated gem in the Bond canon. Now, I think people are maybe giving Lazenby and the chicken lady a little too much slack. <laughs> I have this awful allergy about chickens. Definitely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, but I, I you know what? So. It's still very good, and Diana Rigg gives this franchise a kiss from the jaws of life. Because this movie is basically what gives this franchise any pathos. It's not a kiss. She's giving this movie fucking CPR. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, she gives it a legitimate emotional investment that they trade on for at least 20, 30 years. Yeah, it's like it's like the scene from Madam Web when they have to revive Madam Web. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the sad truth of the James Bond franchise. I reveal at 205 in the morning. The sad truth is they sucker punched and killed a woman at the end of a movie, and they coasted off that for 30 or 40 years until they rebooted, and they immediately did it again. And everyone was like, oh, they figured it out. <laughs> they didn't even coast off of it because they didn't even want to talk about it for so long. It used to be just like this hidden hush Sean hush Connery thing. didn't want to talk about it. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, the, a lot of people say this is the one that people who don't like Bond, this is the one for them. I kind of agree and disagree. Whatever. It's a beautiful mess. 
in my opinion. Did Melissa like this one? No, she hated it. <laughs> okay, well, so much for that. I, I, wouldn't call it, I wouldn't call it a mess of a movie. I think it still gets the job done. I just don't. It's messy. It's messy, yeah. It's the vertigo of uh, James Bond movies. Sure, where, I would agree. For a while, people were like, actually, this is very underrated, and it's actually good. And now people are like, one. wait, no, take it back down. <laughs> <laughs> Calm down a little bit. It is bit. messy because just like the soccer player, it's the GOAT, the greatest of all time. It's it's still a top 10 Bond movie, just not at the top of the top 10. It's in my top five. It is in your top five, Jan, but are we ready? Our strap in, folks, for our top five. Bond fans, it's time to face the music and dance because these are officially the five best James Bond movies. You may not like it, but with an average ranking, of 6.5 and an average rating of 7.875 that's right guys strap in do your kung fu and read the newspaper oh, yeah. because tomorrow never dies is coming in at number five baby Yeah! Absolute banger. Fuck that, Her Majesty's Secret Service now. This is the yeah. true <laughs> underrated James Bond movie. No one yes, I would really agree. appreciates this. Like, even me for a while when I was a kid where you just kind of take this kind of movie for granted. Watching it as an adult, it is so consistently fun and the characters are so over the top and it just keeps building up and up and up and you have one of the best villains with Jonathan Price <laughs> and Pierce Brosnan is like fully hooked into the James Bond thing where he, it's just like there is no Pierce Brosnan he is only Bond <laughs> and even despite the fact that it kind of screws the pooch with the Paris Carver element in the movie where it's just like it's more of a motivation a plot device for him to keep going it doesn't matter because the entire movie is just a giant roller coaster and it is efficient effective mark forster tried to call quantum solace a bullet this is the bullet yeah this is the most adrenaline fueled one this movie's kind of a miracle because this is one of the ones that just like quantum of solace they made kind of without a script but this one yep. really ended up working out. Well, it benefits because they're not concerned with making this the sequel to Casino Royale or making it like a character study at all. It it's is not the sequel to Golden. No, it's Eye. very straightforward, and the action is actually excellent here. He's playing his Game Boy, driving his car. That's amazing. The motorcycle shit. That's amazing. Michelle Yeoh. Michelle Yeoh's great. The the fucking uh, climax is great. And of course, our boy Elliot Carver, out of the uh, eccentric Bond villains, he's the one. Come on. Yeah. It was all about, as we maybe mentioned in the episode, but I'll probably bring it up again because now it's starting to look like our discussion of the future of Bond will have to be another day. Yes. Uh, this movie is the platonic ideal. Platonic in more ways than one, because I think sure. one thing that does get a little short shrift is the theoretical romance with Michelle Yeoh slightly sidelined, the Bond searing emotional psychology slightly sidelined, but everything else is A+. plus. This is like the definition of the breezy entertainment that on paper is, I think, what these movies are supposed to be. They're, they're trying <laughs> to be, until they got too embarrassed and they kept making Daniel Craig movies. Yeah, no, we need Pierce Brosnan surfing a tsunami. Yeah, I would say if Octopussy is the most underrated Bond adventure film, Tomorrow Never Dies is the most underrated Bond action film. This feels like, oh, yeah. if I think of all my favorite fight scenes, you have James Bond beating people up with instruments. You have James Bond with a Nintendo DS car. <laughs> you have James Bond flying that nuke out in, in a great opening. You have James Bond giving the people what they want. And what we want is action and him pretending to go undercover as a banker named James Bond at a party. <laughs> this is the new banker, Mr. Bond. James Bond. Another new banker. I seem to collect them. Which is very silly. Elliot Carver is the greatest Bond villain, and his wife Paris Carver. When I first saw the movie, I'm like, the way they get rid of her is very sad. That is one of the hardest scenes in the Bond canon, as I said earlier, when he finds her dead body. And the whole scene with Vincent Chiavelli. And the way James Bond pulls the tables and basically executes him, and then moves on to play with his toy car. <laughs> 
Oh my god, what an emotional roller coaster. I was actually <laughs> listening to the Spy Hards uh, podcast where they're interviewing one of the heads of MGM, and he revealed Dr. Kaufman was going to get his own spinoff movie at some point. I'm just a professional doing a job. Oh well, yeah, he's one of the greatest one-scene characters. I really wish I listened to that before the Tomorrow Never Dies episode because I'm just like, are you fucking kidding me? That would have been awesome. <laughs> well, you know, uh, Miller's foreman said that he was going to give the guy from uh, the beginning of Amadeus his own spinoff. <laughs> <laughs> Senor, I want to point out that I think it's really stupid that it feels like the James Bond franchise keeps setting up spinoffs because this franchise is too shallow to set up spinoffs. The only good spinoff that ever happened from these movies was Sean Connery's brother. <laughs> and the Broccoli's didn't make that. Mr. and Mrs. Connery did. So yeah, let me just say that on a rewatch with Tomorrow Never Dies, it went up in my rankings because the weird, emotional, haphazard thing, I actually really liked this time. We all gave it an 8 out of 10, except for Jan, who gave it a 7.5 out of 10. Paul put it at number 2. Whoa. Which I very much respect. I'm shocked because this is like, the number one Pierce Brosnan James Bond movie on this list. I, I it's like that yeah. doesn't reflect my list, but I am totally okay with that because more people yeah, need to yeah. see it. It's no one's favorite, but it's a consensus. Well, it's Paul's favorite. It's the platonic ideal, as Paul said. Yeah, yeah. Me and Jake put it at seven, and Jan put it at ten. I am going to lay down a new sick beat for all of you homeboys at the townhouse to listen to while you're listening to this podcast. Coming in hot at number four with an average rating of 8.5 and an average ranking of 6.25. Up yours, woke liberals. It's Goldfinger. Goldfinger. I like that you're introducing all these movies like WrestleMania like <laughs> <Yeah>. characters. <laughs> no, but yeah, this this is definitely the best Connery. Oh, Bond yeah. movie. I don't think it's perfect. No. I. It does bother me that he's a prisoner in Kentucky for the entire <laughs> movie and does nothing. Oh, that's a plus for me. I love that. I never really thought about it until our discussion. <laughs> the most iconic James Bond movie, the reason why the franchise still exists and they don't stop making these is because people couldn't get enough of the exotic sites of Kentucky. Of Kentucky. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it did. This one started Bond Mania, and with good reason, this one has everything. This one brought in all the energy. It has the gadgets, the girls, the villain. Bond has a relationship with the villain. Two of the most iconic shots in action cinema. Yeah. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. One of the best villain hero relationships because yes. you have a villain that embodies everything that the hero detests bad manners and being a freaking slob and an a well they're both assholes but in a different way they're yeah. rude but, one of but he's a bad really sportsman he's ideas. a bad sportsman and that pisses off bond and also bond keeps one-upping him because he's you think you're hot shit fuck you fantastic villain hero relationship like i think that it's so stupid that in this day and age you can go oh lucifer saffin is the villain that really gets under bond's skin no goldfinger cheats at cards yeah and he cheats at golf just the simple fact that he cheats and he has like he employs like a beautiful woman to just be seen with him just seen just seen i'm so glad like to be his girlfriend, but only to be seen like around public places. That's just enough to piss off Bond to go like, I want to make this man's life miserable. And Goldfinger has all the power and the money of China to inflict maximum pain on Bond by keeping him in his Kentucky home. <laughs> and he's fat, which James Bond doesn't like. Yeah, and it's weird because it's like Dr. No from Rush With Love kind of danced around the, you know, the like the fantastical thing. And Guy Hamilton with Goldfinger firmly embraces it, and with that created a whole subgenre of spy movies, like to the point where James Bond isn't just a series, but it's it's the Q-tip 
of <laughs> like these kinds of yes. movies. Yeah, no, it's Goldfinger. Look, Dudoy. It basically kept the franchise going. Every movie wanted to remake Goldfinger. It's a classic movie. Now it's not number one because James Bond is a vile, awful thing. And he <laughs> and he does awful, <laughs> vile things to women. I argue the movie does somewhat blunt the edges of the book, but yeah. If you're offended by Pussy Galore's whole thing, or man talk, or gold lady, no one's gonna say you should not be offended I by I will these cry more, liberal. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine, I get it. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I totally understand, but... Paul's been very quiet, and that's because he gave this the lowest rating a mere 7 out of 10, and he ranked it only... 10 on it. It barely list. made the top 10. It's no. true. Uh, yes. I mean, I was always all right with it, but uh, yes, everything you've said is more or less true. And then on the other side of the scale, we have. I did fully appreciate until this viewing that it really entirely hinges on that barn scene and also the Guy Hamilton. TV aesthetic is here. The gray concrete of Las Vegas would not be possible without the gray concrete of Kentucky. It's funny that Guy Hamilton set the foundation for this entire franchise, but literally pretty much every movie he directed after is he fucking shot he the He didn't bed. set the foundation, but he did set up the, the, the what do you call it, the, the, the beams of the house. The, the Terrence Young I, I don't know, <laughs> I don't fucking know buildings. Terrence Young <laughs> set the foundation, Guy Hamilton, came up with the tacky neon sign that draws people in and makes people yes. go, oh, it's that place with the hot Okay, dog. that's actually a better analogy. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> one of my favorite movies of all time. Yes, Jake has it as number two on his James Bond list. I have it as number five. And Jake's the only one who gave it a 10 out of 10, which is the first earnest 10 out of 10, <laughs> I think. I think so. In a while. Uh, well, no, 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 no. No, Die Another Day is an earnest 10. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure it is, buddy. Sure it is. Okay. Um, <laughs> it, it may shock you. You may not like that, but it's true. <laughs> shocking. Positively shocking. I can't handle the truth. <laughs> but now it's time for my truth. Coming in at number three with an average ranking of six and an average rating of 8.25. This actually makes it, not by ranking, if it wasn't for ranking, this would be the second highest rated James Bond movie. Nobody does it better. It is the hey, one true baby. Bond film, The Spy Who oh. Loved Me! The Spy Who Loved Me. That's what it's all about. This is what I've been waiting for. This is way too high for my list, but I'm okay. You're a fake Bond fan who doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Get out of here. To me, this is... <laughs> Oh, you've offended the master, but no, anyway. Not He's not getting a tattoo. <laughs> He's not getting the Troy pussy. <laughs> this, is, this is, to me, we were, we were talking about what is the quintessential bond. This is it for me, man. Yeah. Like if an alien came down to Earth and was like, what is a James Bond movie? I would show him this movie. It has everything in spades. It's so well directed. The action is so good. I love the gadgets, I love the villain lair, the climax, even though it's a little too long, it's still awesome. They built an entire studio for it. Uh, Moore comes on his own in this one, he's great. Oh, he does? He doesn't need help coming on his own? You're sensitive, Mr. Bond. <laughs> like, oh, come on, and Anya, I like Anya, but it's not like... Yeah, it's uh, definitely the best Roger Moore film, like, easily. For sure. Easily. <laughs> and uh, I will take it over any of the Conneries. That's me. Yeah, same. same any same of here. the Conneries? Wait, even Thunderball? <laughs> Ball? Oh, wait. <laughs> Would Spy oh, Love Me okay. over Thunderball? It's, it's, it's like yes. neck and neck. It is slightly under. I forgot what I wrote down. No, this one's better. But it's true that they are basically the same. But even though this one has its fair share of camp, the filmmaking it is makes it feel so classy, so slick. Yes. No, I agree. I just like the other ones a little bit more. I've talked many times. The best James Bond movies are the ones where you either focus on his relationship with the girl kind of from the beginning to end, like on Her Majesty's Secret Service, The Living Daylight, Casino Royale. Or there are movies where you focus on James Bond's relationship with the villain from beginning to end, like 
Octopussy or Tomorrow Never Dies or Goldfinger. The Spy Who Loved Me is the only James Bond movie that goes, hey, why don't we introduce the girl before the title sequence? Why don't we introduce the villain before the first 15 minutes are over? Why don't we have James Bond do something in the opening sequence that has moral ramifications that will actually impact the core story and or the entire emotional through line of the movie because he shot someone with a ski gun? <laughs> Why don't we have a great song? Why don't we have a villain that honestly is the best Blofeld, even if he's not Blofeld, he was supposed to be? And then why don't we give him a great henchman, Jaws? Him and Anya are peas in a pod. I love their banter. I love how this movie just tells a clean story with character progression that is steeped in the world of James Bond without taking itself too seriously like the Craig movies do. This one keeps it light and frothy. I've waxed poetic about it. Wipe this whole misbegotten franchise off the face of the earth. The Spy Who Loved Me is the only one that really figured it out. I gave it a 10 out of 10. Paul gave it a 7.5. Jan gave it 8.5. Jake gave it a 7. Number two. Now, no, we got to take a commercial break because now we got to get to our most important side bees. Wait, why are we doing it at number two and not number one? Because then it won't be a shock as to what number one is. Oh, I I guess. Spoiler alert, it, this is going to be the most stale-ass top two ever. Anyway. So this one is our most important side uh, awards uh, thing. Who is the best <laughs> Bond actor? Bond. 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 You know the rest. God sends Jimmy Bond. You were expecting someone else? So, Jen, would you like to tell us who your what your Bond ranking is of the actors that played Bond? I'm not even making any sense, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's it's 2.30, <laughs> so I'll make this quick. Um, so, I like all the Bonds. They're all pretty good, but there is a definite ranking. The worst one is uh, our kangaroo boy, George Lazenby. Sorry, ma'am. I don't think he's terrible in it. He's got kind of like an endearing golden retriever, like dumb, like happy guy vibe to him. Pretty wooden, not great. He just happens to be in a really good movie. So no hate to you, George. Don't know you. Keep doing uh, your Bush world adventures. But the least favorite one, I think we can all agree. I don't agree. Then I'm sorry. I think it would be Timothy Dalton. Damn. You will never see the gates of heaven. I know. I think he's a really good Bond, but my problem with him is he is doing just the prototype Daniel Craig and the movies that he's in. Maybe he likes to kill a little more, but they just don't let him go fully with what he wanted to do with them. Then I'm going to have to pick... Roger Moore. Rather a sweeping statement, considering we've never met. I love Roger Moore as Bond. He does the quips the best. Uh, he is a very creepy old man. Uh, very good Bond. <laughs> then, uh, I will say uh, Pierce Brosnan. Oh, point taken. The Bond of my childhood, like we've said many times before, confident moron at his best. He's just so secure, like, of himself. Like, he's wrong almost all the time, and that's just funny to me. Number two, the OG, Sean Connery. Well, that's a neat trick. The quintessential coolest Bond, the coolest guy oh my ever. God. My number one is David Niven. Splendid. His stammer <laughs> is beautiful. Thank you. And my number zero is the best one, in my opinion, Daniel Craig. With pleasure. He's been in a lot of bad movies, and those movies were bad, mainly because of his ego. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but come on, he's a fantastic actor. He does every facet of Bond the best. He is so uh, dramatic when he needs to be. He's so suave when he needs to be. He's even really funny when he needs to be. He is my guy, Daniel Craig, best Bond. Very cool. But he's blonde, so he's the worst one. Yeah, but that's why he's zero. Yeah, he's number zero. He's an yeah. absolute zero. Okay, I'm going to speed run this. Okay. Uh, I mostly agree with Jan, except, let's see, I've got Connery at number three. Bitch. Because he's good. 
<laughs> I've got Daniel Craig at number two. Oh, look, I give it down. And number one is Pierce. Well, I must say, I've had a lovely evening. Oh. Pierce is James Bond. I have no notes about how he plays anything because when you talk about it, you're just talking about the character. You're not even talking about his performance. You're talking about why is James Bond doing that insane <laughs> thing? You're not like, well, Pierce isn't pulling off what clearly should have been something else. It's like, no, he's nailing it every scene. Yeah, you're like, why does James Bond say mojito like that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mojito? <laughs> yes, Daniel Craig is a phenomenal actor who can do it all, but it comes down to the choices and the direction of some of those films. Obviously, he has highest highs, I think most of us can agree. And Connery, he's got the swag, but there's a significant portion of his movies where he does not want to be there, and you can tell, so. Yeah, but he's funny even in those. Yeah. Some of them. I really only think it's it's a problem in one of those movies. Actually, two, maybe two. Okay. <laughs> so one third of his tenure, it is a problem that he does not care that he's in them. <laughs> All right, Troy. That's the thing with Sean Connery is I think well, and Roger Moore too. Those are the two bonds where people are like, we need to get them out. Um, because I've devoted four years of my life to this podcast, I want to give some special shout outs to some supporting actors. No, uh, Christoph Waltz and Donald Pleasance together. You'll always be my favorite. Uh, Blofeld. I will not pick a favorite. Jeffrey Wright, you're my favorite. Felix Leiter, Rory Kinnear as Jan's favorite twink, Bill Tanner. Oh yeah, good on you, man. You did a great job. Desmond Llewellyn. Hell yeah, you were cute. Why'd they even... Ben Wishaw, you're good. You're not Desmond Llewellyn. Oh. Money Penny, once again, Lois Maxwell, no one does it, does it better. And M, hot take, Bernard Lee is still the best M. No one's ever said 007 the way he does it. 007. 007. Uh, Judy Dench does it pretty well. 007. She's the best one. Well, we all love uh, Bernard Lee, our favorite drunk. Oh, yeah, yeah. And beautiful legs. All right. So now on to the bonds. Number eight, David Niven. It's depressing that the word secret agent has become synonymous with sex maniac. He is the real James Bond from World War I. As Casino Royale points out, Ian Fleming considered him a model for James Bond. He's David Niven. He's not playing James Bond. He's David Niven. I wouldn't even say he's the best Bond in that movie. If I remembered his name, I would put that guy with the face who takes fighting lessons for two scenes as the best James Bond in that movie. Terrence Cooper? Yeah, Terrence Cooper would have been a better James Bond. But it was David Niven. Shout out to David Niven. He's the first James Bond to blow up on screen and not the last. Blazing a trail for all who would follow. Barry Nelson, coming in at number seven. No, I don't think so. Babyface four boy. I buy him as a guy who beats people up for a living. He's American. Ew. Six, <laughs> George Lazenby, Australian. You. <laughs> this never happened to the other fella. But no, on a serious note, he's very pretty, and Diane Rigg is good at pretending she's in love with him. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't think he brings a lot to the table. I'm not going to be a revisionist on this. All of his great moments are camera composition. Him mourning Tracy, that is Peter Hunt blocking him to look sad. They had to dub him for the voice. He is not a good James Bond. He is just pretty. Um, he's not the worst actor I've ever seen, but if we're ranking James Bonds, I'm not gonna say he's underrated. I'm glad he didn't stick around. Number five, actually me and Jan, I think are on the same page on this one, Timothy Dalton. Go ahead, tell him what you want. Too emotional. <laughs> I want James Bond to be an invested protagonist, but you cannot play him like Hamlet. You cannot play him like King Lear. That is what Timothy Dalton is doing. Timothy Dalton may be the best actor to ever play James Bond. I haven't seen his stage work. He is a very talented actor, very gifted actor, very classically trained. He is approaching James Bond like a tragic hero, like a classical protagonist. His movies are not built to support that, and I would argue it's a mistake to make most James Bond movies try to support that. So he's just a little disjointed, and he throws off his movies. It's not a bad performance. It's just not James Bond in my book. So again, I'm glad he didn't stick around. Maybe <laughs> if he had made another one, he would have developed it further, but good riddance. I love you in Lion in Winter and Flash Gordon and Looney Tunes back in action, Tim. All right, now we're getting to like top tier Bond. Number four, 
Pierce Brosnan. No, no, no. Take the best of Roger Moore. Take the best of Sean Connery. He is the ideal James Bond. I saw him as a child, and Paul's correct. You don't ask what is Pierce Brosnan doing. What is James Bond doing? Because he has James Bond down to a science. I don't much care for James Bond as a hero, and I don't root for him, and that is why he is five, because he is a psychopath, <laughs> and I don't like him. <laughs> he is not likable. He scares me. I have nightmares. I always say he should have played Raul Silva in Skyfall. Even now, I'm looking over my shoulder, thinking he's going to pop behind me in my car and, and put a gun to my head. He scares me. It's your sleep paralysis demon. <laughs> He is the Joker of the James Bonds. All right, number three. I have to do this by court order. Sean Connery. You're joking. In case you haven't picked up by now, the Sean Connery era is not my favorite. Of all the James Bonds, he truly cared the least. Sean Connery is a great actor. He's great in Robin and Marion, Zardoz, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Great in all these movies. Man Who Would Be King. Great in all these movies. Not particularly great in his James Bond movies, but here's the thing. He's Sean frickin' Connery, and he's playing James Bond, even when he shouldn't be playing him anymore, which is most of it. <laughs> it's still Sean Connery as James Bond. He's the coolest guy. You're becoming Jerry Seinfeld. My <laughs> <laughs> God, he's James Bond. <laughs> like, I get why Roger Ebert gave Never Say Never Again three and a half out of four stars. Because Sean Connery was James Bond. It just feels right. So he's number three. Now, this rewatch made me flip my top two. Number two. Daniel Craig is probably the best actor with a body of work on screen that I can go. Yes, he's the best actor to play James Bond. He made James Bond a full-throated character. I loved following his arc from Casino Royale to Spectre. He made him human. He could. He was serious, but he couldn't do the quips. But you know what? That didn't matter. He had a defined take on Bond. Connery and Brosnan were just doing the amoral Bond of our imagination, which is a terrible character. <laughs> Daniel Craig created this new character that is dark, tortured, but very human, but still recognizably Bond, which I really thought was an achievement. I had this opinion, and then I saw No Time to Die. And then I went back and I rewatched Quantum and I rewatched Casino Royale to No Time to Die, which included rewatching Quantum of Solace and Skyfall. And I decided this version of James Bond doesn't really make a lot of sense. Well, then you're an idiot. It is an achievement, but it's a flawed achievement. And because all the movies are so tied together, yeah, it is more annoying to me that, sure, none of these movies were the worst movies ever made, but because No Time to Die and Quantum of Solace are so bad and such pivotal movies in his arc, and because he's responsible, and because he also does not care just as much as Connery does at points, I have to knock him out of the top spot. So I really have to give the top spot to the man who embodies James Bond to me. The man who I don't think James Bond would still be a franchise if he never played him. The man with the most official Bond films. The man who made James Bond a heroic figure, a funny figure, a moving figure, a figure of pathos, of adventure, of fun. I smile whenever I see his face. Whenever we make a clip of him, it goes through the roof. People love this man. I love this man. The children of the world love this man. Sir Roger Moore. Thank you. Made James Bond into a cinematic uh, hero. I thought you were going to say not... Neil Connery. <laughs> no, no, no. He's James Bond's brother. He made Ian Fleming's James Bond, this awful, racist, bigoted <laughs> man, into an endearing cinematic icon, even when he's making the worst movies I've ever seen. Where he's racist and bigoted. <laughs> and are also racist and bigoted. He's such a scamp. I love him so dearly. Roger Moore is my favorite James Bond. L to quote Jan, Roger Moore is dead. Long live Roger Moore, hero of the Soviet Union. There we go. So we have three different best James Bonds. What's yours going to be, Jakey boy? Well, the eight listed. 
Uh, at the bottom of the list at number eight is Barry Nelson. Pain and killing's part of my job. If you're trying to characterize James Bond in like a noir kind of setting, I guess it kind of makes sense, but that is not the character. Number seven is David Niven. You ought to be ashamed. David Niven has a stammer, somewhat funny moments in Casino Royale, but the movie sucks. Number six is George Lazenby. It's quite all right, really. As we've said before, he's a plank of wood. I will say that he does action really well. I think he's one of the most physical James Bonds, like he's up there with Daniel Craig, but being that the movie is really reliant on this love story, he doesn't really have a lot to give. Thank God Diana Rigg is there to support him. Not great. Number five, Troy Don't Kill Me, but it's Roger Moore. Right, you've made your point. He might be the Bond that kept the series around. He was consistent, a consummate professional, all-around good guy. But most of his movies are kind of meh. He's still a ton of fun to watch, and I find him very charming. But I think my next picks I like a little bit more. Uh, coming in at number four, Timothy Dalton. Thanks for all you've done. Yeah, it's prototype Craig. Like, the movies aren't really on the caliber of actor that uh, Timothy Dalton is. But Timothy Dalton still has a great screen presence. Uh, he kind of has that danger element that the danger element that Connery gives, except he doesn't quite have the same charm as uh, Connery or more. But uh, I think what he does with the character is is still fine. And he's a great screen presence as James Bond. This one was difficult between three and two because I actually changed my opinion at the end of this saga. It used to be reversed, Whoa. but now it is. Number three, Daniel Craig. You're a bloody idiot. Oh my He's God. He's a fantastic actor. I love Casino Royale with all my heart. I love Skyfall as well. I think Daniel Craig is a terrific actor. And in Casino Royale specifically, he really gives that interiority. And the movie is there to support that interiority that, you know, Timothy Dalton didn't really have. But it's a problem with the movies where he started to become like really disinterested in doing the series and as a result the character isn't that consistent number two is pierce the pleasure i'm sure was all mine there's nothing really neat more i can add to pierce he is james bond and number one you guys are all going to hell for not putting him at number one it's sean connery i love you i mean despite the lows of his series <laughs> He's the classic. He is the classic one. He is when Bond, we think of yeah. James Bond, he is that lovable rapscallion who, in any other movie, he would be the villain. But he walks in with that naughty schoolboy energy, and you just you just love watching him. Daniel Craig also has this, where he's like this kind of gorilla man, but he's in a tailored suit. And that contradiction, I think, works best on Connery. Okay, apart from the suits, what do you like about this man? <laughs> he's just so effortless in that role. He's not quite like Pierce Brosnan as the platonic ideal of James Bond, but he has that rapscallion nature to him that is so endearing as a screen presence. There's a reason why he became a star after being in these movies. And sometimes when he's not even trying in Diamonds Are Forever, he's still really funny. <laughs> I feel like Sean Connery, like, again, the best Bond actors come at it with a different approach, and they're great for different reasons. If I consider Craig the best actor to play James Bond, I would say Connery is maybe the best movie star. Like, yeah. if people still love him despite not caring it's because he's got he's got the riz he's got the sauce that mystique this is interesting we all with no consensus on who the best james bond is a little something for everyone with all of them yeah. now let's rank all the jokers so yes. okay no. mark hamill <laughs> it is funny that we all agree that pierce is definitive but that doesn't mean he's the best <laughs> yeah wait 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 let's break this down like it is funny that we did not plan this we did a james bond podcast with four people on it and each one of us picked a different one of the four longest, like, extended tenure bonds. And none of us speak Timothy Dalton. <laughs> well, because oh. he cares too much. <laughs> Finds me all thanking for it. All right, Troy, what is our top two? Coming in at number two, with an average ranking of 4.75 and the highest rating in the series with a rating of 8.75, Skyfall.
Yeah. Yeah. We so know Starfall Harry. has the highest average rating. But it is not the number one ranked movie. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, Skyfall. You know it. You love it. It's imperfect, but it looks beautiful. You're invested in the action. Daniel Craig is great. His relationship with Judy Dench is great. One of the series' best villains in Raul Silva, played by Javier Bardem. It's just very, very fun, very slick, lots of good ideas. <laughs> endlessly, endlessly rewatchable. Great villain. Love him. Love the full penetration. Good movie. Paul, do you have anything to say about the most successful financially James Bond movie of all time? Yes, it made a big, a more billion dollars. A more and billion. And it looks nice, and as we detail, doesn't really add up, but whatever. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just fun. The themes are really, like, awful muddled, but it's so much fun. Yeah. And I at the end, you cheer because M has his cushiony door back. You, you cheer despite the fact that Bond is completely fucked up everything. <laughs> yeah, he's completely <laughs> failed. And that is the mark of a great movie. <laughs> yeah. So many people have died because of James Bond in this movie, all directly because of his inaction or lack of action. Like, oh my God, if Pierce Brosnan was in this movie, it would be like a manifesto of some kind. It is so weird. And this weird movie, however, Sam Mendes cracked the case. If you put some thought in the staging, hire some good actors, and just steal all your major plot beats from The Dark Knight. You got a banger. People will say this is a great movie, Uh, including us. Even though we all admit it's a mess, Jake gave it a 10. Jan gave it a 9. Me and Paul both gave it 8. Jan put it highest at number 2. Jake and Paul put it at number 3. And I did the brave, principled stance of switching it with the man with the golden gun. So it is 11. And man with the okay. golden gun became okay. 10. As it should be. Number one, baby. And now, drum roll. Drum roll. What could it be? What You'll could never it guess. Be? You can never guess. You'll never guess. I will kill all of you and then myself if you don't let me say what this is right now. It's epic movie, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it's epic movie. You did it. You make a movie film have happy ending. Ah! Not. No, it's the movie Epic Movie was cashing in on the trailer for with an average ranking of 1.75 and an average rating of 7.75, which means it is lower than every other movie in the top five in terms of rating. Oh my God, that's shocking. The 2006 Casino Royale. Wait, so who gave it less than an eight? Well, Paul, we worked on this together. Uh, you gave me the stats, and I remember this conversation clearly when you reminded oh, me of it. Right. Oh, no. <laughs> Jake gave it a 10. I gave it a nine, and I it did fall below Octopus. <laughs> what? Paul, you gave it an eight. You gave it an eight. All right. Your yeah. favorite Bond movie. And Jan announced at the end of it is thing that because Daniel Craig is blonde, <laughs> four out of ten. <laughs> you know, mother, still wait, so one. you didn't listen it's to me like, when I said it in my heart, it's a ten, but you listened to Jan when he sarcastically <laughs> says a four? This is a sham. I think that was the only number he <laughs> said. I'm that was the sure. only number. Yeah, that's, the, that's the one number I said. Oh, and Jake, Jan said he's. Blonde. A lot of times, Jake, when you gave alternative ratings, check the tapes, fans of the show. Jake will often say, I would give this rating, but I don't actually mean it. <laughs> Jan never said he didn't mean At it. At least I'm straightforward no, about no, it. No, I mean, listen, <laughs> if, we, if we ignore the atrocity of a blonde bond, it's a 10 out of 10, baby. Too late, this, Buster. <laughs> this, this is, to me, by far... The best one is the only one that's a real movie. <laughs> it's it's one of my favorite movies. One of the best Western action films of all time. It's a great character drama. It's a great romance. It's a great tragedy. Every fucking scene is so good. You cannot stop watching it. Daniel Craig is so fucking good. They did the Batman Begins, but better than Batman Begins. It is amazing. In every single aspect, it's the best at everything. 
Its only shortcomings are literally that he's blonde and there's no Kincaid in this one. Yeah. Welcome to Scotland. Apart from it, it's perfect. <laughs> can I, I, I'd like to do the counterpoint since I'm the most negative and then Paul and Jake can bring us home with the, sure. the rousing happiness. So I quite like this movie. It is very good. I am the only person who did not put it number one on my list. I put it at a mere four out of 29. <laughs> I really love it. Yes, James Bond and Vesper Lind. Origin stories. There's a reason we tell them so much. It's fun to see how this guy came to be. And it somehow makes the original novel, which is very misogynist, work while being faithful and updating Bond to a new era. My main critique of this movie, incredibly meandering. The whole first hour is just wandering all over the place, a oh. character study into a psychopath that this movie does acknowledge as a psychopath and Vesper soften it, softens him. And I, I love it. I love it in that respect, but that's just it for me. It's too meandering. And I like more of the dramatic through line of three other Bond movies better, but yeah, it's Casino Royale. If you don't like the 2006 Casino Royale, to quote David Thompson, there are always novels and paintings and other art forms you can enjoy besides the movie. Maybe it's not for you. Cool. Uh, yeah, this movie's a banger. It's pretty much the only, when we say real movie, it's like, oh yeah, everything works here and everything's like pretty damn good. And this is the one you can show people and normies will like it. And they frequently do. <laughs> Jake. Yeah, Casino Royale is the best James Bond movie ever. For the first time in the series, it actually grapples with James Bond going through a character arc. I would disagree with Troy that I don't think that the first half is meandering because it closely links Bond to the circumstances that lead to the poker game. And it gives us a little bit of business of what James Bond is like before he meets Vesper. And then we get to what James Bond is like after he meets Vesper and her subsequent death and how that makes him the man he is for better or for worse. We had disagreements on it, but the thing about this movie is that it actually emphasizes key moments in this character's transition, unlike other movies that insist on growth, but there isn't really anything there or it's very convoluted. This actually has moments where there is a change and emphasizes that. And even if you come away with a different conclusion, those elements are still there and it doesn't affect your enjoyment of the movie. This movie is a perfect Bond movie, even though it doesn't have gadgets, even though it doesn't have Q. <laughs> Yeah, a part of me is kind of kicking my It's like, well, this is a movie that doesn't have the stuff that you like about James Bond. How could you put this at number one? Isn't that like a normie thing or like you're embarrassed to like? It's like, that's because this movie is that good. Simply put, <laughs> the movie is that good. I, I also am <laughs> embarrassed to like these movies. <laughs> yeah, are you embarrassed to like the non-embarrassing one of the embarrassing franchises, <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, here's the thing. You can see it as a cop out of like, you know, when people put on Her Majesty's Secret Service at the top, it's like, well, you just like it because of this and it doesn't have like the Goldfinger-ness or, you know, the Spy You Love Me-ness or whatever that is commonly... Thought out in James Bond. To be clear, you also love Die Another Day, so yes. that's your get-out-of-jail card. Yeah, the, inside you there are two wolves. Yeah. And one of the wolves has aged horribly and wasn't- Now this is turning into a therapy session. Yeah, this this movie's a masterpiece and I fucking love it. Okay, so now now can we rank the Jokers? Uh, yeah. I think <laughs> that might have to wait for another day because we're all losing our minds. Yes. We will have to come back next week, listeners, to hear us discuss- the, the future, future. Of James Bond. That's going to be a fun episode. That's going to be like forty minutes long. Yes. Uh, no, I just want to point out as the res as the producer of this episode um, that this whole <laughs> series, you guys have been wondering, wouldn't watching all the James Bond movies in order be just like eating a lot of McDonald's? Aren't they just supersizing themselves? Yes, yes, we did, and look what happened. Look at us now. Look at how We're all fat as shit. <laughs> I just turned into the ending of Blood Meridian. I haven't read that book. <laughs> no, but really, it's just like Troy hasn't slept in a week. Uh, Paul uh, has turned four hundred pounds. <laughs> I I have chain smoked again. Your wife is dead. My wife is dead. 
Jake is back to the bottle. You know, all of it. This, this podcast has changed us for the worse. Uh, I'm very grateful to have been on this journey with you guys. But it's not over it's yet. It's not over One yet. More well, episode. we have plenty of time for final summations when we discuss We gotta talk the about future. the future. Of James All right, goodbye. Bond. Tune in next Bye-bye. week. Final thoughts on James Bond and the future and we blow and up. the Joker. Ooh. Never the Joker. <laughs>